Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Lisa J. Welcome back to part four. Part four with Lisa J. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for coming back on the show once again. <laughs> Thank you for having me. No, seriously, Chris, like, and everybody who's listening, thank you for giving me this platform to just tell you my story. Um, As we left off on Wednesday, we were talking about uh, New York and your disability and um, Mm. if you had come out and you had talked about a uh, assistant to your agent who had basically (laughs) told you, Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have the voice for acting, but that's about <laughs> it. Um, that's her words. So I'm just paraphrasing here, people. Right. She's an amazing actress. But how do you recover from something like that? How do you go, you know what? F you, I'm going to do what I love to do. Mm, well, some people don't recover, eh? Yep. And to those ones, you guys have my heart. Like, that is so sad. Um. Oh, I had to have a serious talk with myself. Well, see, I kept getting voice gigs. So, you know, I think that is what kind of strung me along. And I, I, that, that yearning never quit. I think anybody who's a painter or a musician or an interviewer, like anybody who has that creative brain that likes to connect with people, fashion, you know, if it's in you, it's like a curse and a blessing. It's never going to leave. You have it. You love to connect with people. I think with me, I love to connect with the audience. You know, um, it's a feeling and that never went away. And I knew that, OK, it's just not going to happen in Toronto. Like I pissed off enough people like going to New York and giving up a show, um, dealing with my illness and saying, hey, guys, I need time alone to like not be emaciated and like give myself the time and the medical attention that I needed to address my rheumatoid arthritis, but also how underweight I was and stuff like that. But the feeling never went. So I knew it wasn't going to happen in Toronto, New York. You know what? I love New York and, and it didn't make sense for me to go there because I, I loved theater, but it accessible wise, it's just not accessible. It's like in the in the early 2000 and the millennial, it was not accessible. So I took a trip and I think this is why like half of it is like this universe and half of it is you. And I took this trip because the nagging feeling wouldn't go away. I said, well, do something about it. Don't sit around and complain. Do something took a trip to Los Angeles. And while I was in Los Angeles, um, I met up with Stella Adler's director down there, John Jack Rogers. I'm getting emotional just thinking about him. And um, I audited a class with Tim McNeil and Laura Leva. And then I cried. I was like, this is where I need to be. You just know sometimes. Flash forward, it took me two years of convincing myself okay, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to go and do it. And um, I rented out my apartment and I made all of the preparations I needed to do. And I went, but you're talking to one in a million or one in whatever the statistic is. Do you know how many kids out there who were told, no, you can't because you're gay. Who's going to believe you being uh, on television? I've talked to those artists. And I've seen them and I've told them, no, you can play whatever you play. Like, you know what I mean? Well, I think Um, it even happens today. And it's not even just in the early 2000s because straight people are still getting gay roles. Gay people are not getting the roles that they are. Trans people are not getting the roles that they they should be getting. Right. It is such a stigmatized industry that to Mm -hmm. even overcome a comment like that must be challenging in itself. Well, think about it, okay? If you're this young gay kid or if you're like me, uh, this young disabled kid who's been forced to lie about it, and then you find the courage to come out and talk about it and say, this is who I am, and then you're punished monetarily for, you know, and you're even told to give up on your dreams because nobody's going to accept you as a gay or disabled artist or person of color, 
Like, come on, guys. But, you know, this is where this adversity stuff work, advocacy work really pisses me off sometimes because it's like even today. um, People are playing trans who are straight. There are people playing disabled, too. But the talent pool is out there. So it like it should not be affecting it. There are people of different sexual orientations who are very capable, very talented people and very skilled because there's a difference between skill and talent and they can hone in on their craft and they can perform, but then they get passed over. Yeah. And the same thing can be said for indigenous or ethnically ambiguous or people of color, but it's coming it's a lot better now than it was in 1999 even. Wow. But I can't believe that it's still happening in the gay community. Like, come on. Yeah. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, getting back to your story, that transition from New York to LA yet again, yeah. come from downtown Toronto, you, you know, big city living. So New York is bigger than Toronto. LA is a unique entity in its own. Um, Getting to LA as a theater nerd, as an actress, were you expecting much your first year or were you just there to learn and then see where it took you? I was only there to learn and see where it took me. Remember, I still had that mentality, like I'm going to give up. I went there to, to be really to be like an F you. I got accepted by the artistic director who studied directly under Stella Adler herself. And he told me to come and study here. So I'm going to come. I'm going to be here for two years. I'm going to go back to Toronto because I was still a councilwoman for Actor Toronto and on the national um council for people uh for the diversity committee so i was like i'm going to come back and say look at me it's possible maybe set up a scholarship for other people who are disabled coming from actor toronto to study at stella adler's you know but then i fell in love with it and i started getting opportunities so then my life took on a different role i know ah after studying at stella adler's it 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 broke that curse of nobody wants you because you're a disabled actress. It was the first time I was like, you mean people would actually hire me? And they're like, of course they will. Because for the first time, my talent spoke for itself. Not my Asian eyes, not my crooked fingers, not my limp, you know, not my frizzy Afro hair. It was my talent. They thought I was crazy for for wanting to stop. I just want to I just want to make sure that uh, we're clarify. I'm clarified on this because I'm, I, I'm I'm trying to make sure that I'm following this so that way my listeners can follow this. You had quote unquote come out of the closet as a person with a disability as with rheumatoid arthritis in L.A. or in New York. Even before New York in Toronto, eighteen. But you, but you had not come out officially to your people that you were auditioning your your agent until you were in new uh, la no 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 so 18 years old i came out and said i have rheumatoid arthritis yeah and my agents kept me but there were people along the way her assistant one day my agent wasn't in the office and yes. her okay said, don't do this then I went to New York and I would have stayed in New York, but it's not accessible. Like in 2001, I, my body couldn't keep up with it. And then flash forward to um, going to L.A. It's because I still couldn't give up on the fact that I was never going to act again. And so I thought I wanted to just go to school. And as an F you to the people who said you're never going to act again. I went to theater school and I went to the best fucking theater school and I got the best training from the best people in the industry where celebrities go to train and celebrities send their like kids to train. And I thought I was just going to go there and get it out of my system and then come back to Toronto and just live my life again, going back to voice work. But what happened was um, my teachers really started supporting me. They really started supporting me. And then I found a home in LA's theater scene. During your time so at the school in L.A., mm-hmm. 
were your teachers pushing you towards auditioning in certain theater productions or were you openly going out there? Because um, that might be a misconception that even if you go to a theater school, your teachers are just there for the money. So they're not going to really push you. They're just there to collect a paycheck. So this school, yet again, is probably one of the most prestigious uh, theater schools in all of uh, the world. Were the teachers helping you out and saying, you know what, go out for this role. I think you'd be perfect for this role. Or, hey, you should look into this uh, this theater production because they might be looking for someone just like you. Well, in Stella Adler, LA, um, they, you have to attend. So if it affects your attendance, no, they can't. Because first and foremost, they're a discipline. And that's what I loved about their school. Um, they do support their uh, their school students um, who do get professional gigs outside of school but if it affects your partner if it affects the scene study that you're in you're booted out that's what I loved about that school you're not treated like anything special nobody cares about what your credits are people care about if you can deliver in the class Um, but no they did not um, say go for this or go for that but when I did audition on my own um, because I got a breakdown for Isela Sanchez, um, I had to get special permission from my school because I'm on a visa and all that. Like they can, they have certain legal things that they have to look after too. But they really did support me and all of the kids came out. They came out to Compton Mm -hmm. to see me in my first professional show in Los Angeles. So let's talk about that first professional show in Los Angeles. Um, You are a a student or I'm assuming this is after school or during school, uh, like, like you're playing after school hours. How, what was the experience like for that? Okay. So um, this is when I'm just studying in school (laughs) and I'm going into my second year, my graduating year at Stella Adler, but I've got, um, I just made it work. I don't know how I, uh, I had, I had, I was the lead in Lynn Manning's um, the unrequited, which is like based on this Jewish play called the Dybbuk. And I had to go to rehearsals like Tuesday to Sunday. And I just made it work. I can't tell you how I did, but I did. And there was like one time, so it was in Compton near Watts. Right. <clears throat> and, um, I didn't realize that because I've never lived in Los Angeles before. So when I got the breakdown, um, the, it was with Cornerstone theater and like one of their assistants was like, it's in, it's in Watts. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, yeah. Okay. I've never heard of Watts before. Never. I never think of like uh, that Tupac song, like city of Compton, good old Watts. I didn't think of that. So I, I rent I rent this car and I drive out to Com, and then I see Compton Boulevard. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm in Compton, and then I was like, Oh my gosh, this is pretty far. And um, I ended up auditioning for like a side, like a side role, and then they're like, Actually, can we have you audition for Isela Sanchez? And I ended up getting that and performing it. It was really that fun. Must, it was a that really must have great been experience. like a huge boost to your ego. First off, you're applying, you're you're auditioning for a role that is not the one of the leads, and then they ask you to audition for one of the leads. So that must have been like a huge boost after hearing what you had heard, saying you're never going to make it in this industry, and then them saying, "No, you're making it in this industry, mm-hmm. and we want you to put, we want to put you center stage, basically." It just made me want to like, it made me appreciate Los Angeles theater and like those people who are willing to take a risk on me. And I, it really made me sad because I really thought I was going to be returning to Toronto. Like at that time I wasn't going for my visa or green card or anything. Um, it, 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 but it showed me how attitudes could change to for the better in Toronto. And I wanted to bring that knowledge back. Um, I didn't know that my life would take on such a journey, but Bill Pullman came out to our closing wow. night. Oh yeah. Oh is yeah. It, is, side, side note, side note on that <laughs> one. Is it true that some of the actors come backstage and like congratulate everyone or is that sort of a yeah. myth and fairy tale? No, some of the people come back. And gra- really? Who are you talking about? 
What, like in, 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 in New York, they always say, oh, this big celebrity. Look, I'm just throwing oh, out yeah. Beyonce because literally that's the only person I can think of right now. And I don't know why. But what? Beyonce was in the show in the audience and she came backstage. Did Bill Pullman come backstage and say congratulations, guys? Yeah, he did. He did. He did. I know. And I don't talk about it because I don't want to sound like a, you know. Girl, I'd be telling no. everyone. <laughs> Really? Okay. Because he's amazing in the center, isn't he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'd be going good. around going, I knew him. I, I knew him yeah. when he said I met hello, him once. And he said, good job. He said, great work. Yes. Oh my God. You want names? I've got so many names, but like, I just don't ever want. <laughs> I, met, I met William Shatner at a convention <gasps> for a printer, a printing convention once. I still talk to about it to this day. I walked up. I want to him, know. Can I, get, can I get an autograph? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I have a, okay. I have a show. Okay, you, you have a question. Okay, you said, isn't it nerve wracking to know that you might mess up on your lines? So I have a William Shatner story about how he messed up his lines at Stratford Theater Festival. <laughs> and I, because okay, I was talking to somebody and I was like, I'm so afraid of messing up my lines. And and he's like, Listen, one time I don't know who told me. I think it was. I think, I think it was Gordon Pitson. And one, one of the times I was stalking him at a party, <laughs> I just sat beside him and I picked his brain up. Our, and he's like, look, don't be afraid of that. And if you ever like miss your lines in theater, one time William Shatner was at the Stratford Theater Festival and he, he forgot his line. And I think it was for King Lear or something. And then he just, he knelt down like this. He went like in the, that pose of like Olympus or whoever that statue, the statue of David, where he's like, I can't, I can't. And then his co-star is like, to thine own, <laughs> to thine own soul, thy will be true. And he's like, I can't to thine own soul, thou will be true. And like, the point is your boy, William, did theater in Stratford, forgot his line, your biggest fear, my biggest fear. But Gordon Pinson told me that never be afraid of that because one of your co-stars will come down and whisper in your ear the Shakespearean word. Wow. Well, and that's, it's true, right? Like you can't always expect to be a person of one in theater, I'm assuming, but mm-hmm. you are a team. You are an ensemble. You are a group of people who are there to put on a perfect, a good performance. And you will rely on your fellow actors to help you out when time calls, right? That's the only time it's ever going to be a great production. And that is a very rare thing because uh, like you can't like have your ego involved in it. I think and everybody who's in it needs to want to be there and needs to want to be part of it and needs to want to like give their their performance away to the audience and have the audience enjoy it. When you have all of those working components coming together, you are going to give the audience the best time of their life. And when the audience has the best time of your life, you as an actor, there's no feeling like it. There's no feeling like it. And I'm, I've had the great the great opportunity to work on like a couple of productions where it's like everybody wanted to be there and it's visceral. It's an energy. And Before you really get to one, of the, one of the ones that I want to talk about. Okay. Before this interview, uh, like just for my listeners who are, who are listening, um, mm-hmm. Lisa sent me basically her CV of what <laughs> theater productions she has ever been in in her whole entire life, which oh, no. to me, I was like, holy crap, I have two episodes that I could totally fill with this. Yay. <laughs> Good. There's one that I want to talk about because when I read the name of it, I went, huh? 99 okay. Ways to F a Swan <laughs> by Kim Rosenstock. F- yes! First off, what is this? The Play writer of, of New Girl. Oh my God. Okay. So the best theater company, and it introduced me to Caitlin Hart, who is like my one of my favorite people in the world. Um it, it's it was a comedy. And the way it was done or produced or directed before. So I go on this audition and there is um, called 99 ways to F a swan. They send is it actually me, F a swan or is it 
fuck 99 a swan. ways to fuck a swan. Okay. <laughs> yes. And so it's this great thing. But then we get to the first day of rehearsals and they're like, there's not going to be press because Kim Rosenstock is afraid of having like really bad critics. Like the time they did it when she premiered it in New York, she got torn to pieces. But every single day without press from word of mouth, we packed that audience, the audience through word of mouth in Los Angeles. Wow. The place where like dreams are made on film, we packed a 99 seat theater for three shows every weekend. And it was, and that, remember when I was telling you about that essence where like the audience feels that you feel it. So we all felt it all of like, and that's where I met like, um, Alex Marshall Brown. She's my friend to this day. And, um, Everybody, Caitlin Hart and the Illyrian players. I'm still friends with Carly Wexstein. Everybody wanted to be there. Everybody wanted to deliver to that show. And my God, nobody without press could ever fill a theater the way we feel, filled a theater. But that's how powerful it can be. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. It tells yeah. you that, you know what, as much as, New York is the quote unquote epicenter of Broadway of theater. Yeah. Other locations that can. Man, Los Angeles has a vibrant theater scene. Are you kidding? There's more actually, do you want to know something? There's more theaters. There's more theater venues in LA than New York city. That's what somebody told me. I don't know if that's true. Allegedly. Allegedly. For allegedly those who are not watching the video of this, I'm doing air quotes around <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. Um, yet again, another uh, area that I want to talk about is you. we talked about the ensemble of the cast working together. Um, mm-hmm. One of the theater productions that you were part of, you actually mm-hmm. were nominated for Best <gasps> Acting Ensemble and Best Play for twenty the, for 2015's o- Ovation Awards. And I want I don't know the name of the play because I it's sort of called What of the Night. What of the Night. That's what I was going to say, but I was like, okay. Yeah. She said Marie Irene for Fornes. Fornes, yeah. Fornes. Marie, yeah. So Irene. What Fornes. a night. What is this play about? And being nominated as an ensemble cast and overall best play, how was that yeah. experience? Oh my God. It was like, okay. So the, it was the same directress. It was Caitlin Hart. And now really? she has the, yep. Yeah, and she has a, a theater called The Vagrancy. As soon as I read it, I was like, and she told me what part that she wanted me to audition audition for she was I was like I have to do it it's such a heart achingly brutal play and um it started off off Broadway with Maria Irene Fornius and it's like it's a play about money basically that's how we marketed it and it was like this tiny little play that was the the production for hell that I was telling you in my last in my last interview with you like anything Cause she's so specific and she's such a creative genius. She's like, no, I want it this way. And it has to be done like that. And her texts just didn't come through. And you know, it's live theater. Everybody is working 12 hours. You know what I mean? And we had some breakdowns literally. And I would be there going, guys, this is the little engine that could. We had Alex Marshall Brown in that production as well. And, and I was like, guys, this is the little engine that could, let's just keep applying ourselves. Do we believe in this? Yes, we believe in this. Okay, let's keep it going, you know? And soon people from the ovation committee started coming out and going, why aren't you guys like getting, um, I don't know, whatever the checklist is. So thank God we had Jeannie Hackman um, and her husband come out and they're like, they really supported us. And they made, I don't know, I don't know how they made the juries come out because you need at least 13 jurors, I think, to come out. Next thing I know, that was my last production ever in Los Angeles. And I knew that. And because I I could feel like my visa was running out, um, my, my health was running out, really. And I was like, this is my last one. And... Um, somebody saw me in it and they were like, do you want to be in this next production? And I lied. 
And I was like, no, I'm going to go to Canada for Christmas. It was around Christmas, but I knew I was never coming back. So like that was the biggest heartbreak ever. And then I'm fast forward in Canada grieving and I get this email from Caitlin and it's like, guess what? We've been nominated for an ovation award. And wow. so, yeah. And it was like the best night ever. Were you able so to you go down? Ever, oh, I went down for um, the nominating, um, like the nomination night where they made the nominations. And um, I went down for the ovation night with like my best friends who really, really helped me pack up and move my life back to Canada. And it was just such an emotional 180. And if like, again, we're talking about signs, right? And like half of it is me and then half of it is the world. They're like, I really thought done, donezo, you know, wow. no more. Retired Lisa, everybody's right. And then you find out you're nominated for like one of the biggest awards in Los Angeles theater scene. It's something you know, it's going to be nagging at the back of my brain and my creative juices right now are like, okay, proof is in the pudding. If you get an opportunity here and if it's good, I'll be right all over it. I'm not done yet. I know that. Leaving LA to come back to Canada, like you said, is the hardest decision that you probably have had to make in the last decade, two decades. Yeah. Um, you look back on that decision. Was it the right decision for the time? Because I know you said your health was declining at the time and the cost of health care in America is not the cheapest. So no. coming out here in to Canada and having that free and that there's another sticky point that I won't talk about, but semi free <laughs> medical yeah, yeah. Uh, issues. You can have a podcast exactly. Um, do you regret doing it? No, because honestly, I really would have lost my life. Like, I don't want to. Oh, my God. That was such a drama queen, like victim. Like, no, I don't want it to come across as that. But like, really, the arthritis was starting to like, like my doctors who were like watching over me were telling me they're like, you, you need to get on a biologic and it's progressing. And because I was getting by with steroid shots like every eight oh, weeks, wow. they're like it's starting to affect your. Yeah. It just started to infect my organs and stuff like that, um, and which is what like big lots of shots of steroids do. Like your body functions only on the steroids and then like it can't produce it on its own. So you're always going to be in this like adrenal crash state, you know, and that I crashed. And you know what is so strange I was going on Craigslist for some reason, and I had found this study that was paying our rheumatoid arthritic people to be part of their like um, medicine. And I went out and I met the doctor and she was administering Humira. And she said, I was going to sign you up for three years. And I was like, and I just couldn't wait. I just couldn't wait. I was in so much agony. And like, after I bought my plane ticket, everything, after I gave up my apartment, everything, I get a call from the doctor saying, we got the grant. Do you want us to give you the, like, if you want to start coming in? I was like, it's a little too late because I had already like, um, everything was already in progress. Of Yeah. I don't think, I think I wouldn't have it any other way because you know why I came back to the industry and to the places of trauma, not just professionally, but other things, you know, how our illnesses go and stuff like that. Yeah. And I got to see it with a different, I got to see Toronto and, and all of its challenges and heartbreaks with adult eyes and a wow. little bit of self-esteem. And I think I would not have it any other way because I I'm a different woman now. I feel like it took me until like my thirties to actually grow the fuck up. And I think it's because I had to be taken out of this environment. You, so no. you, you come back to Canada in 2015 after the nominations, after that play, um, mm -hmm. the industry in Canada has changed. I'm assuming since the last time you were uh, last auditioning year. for roles, um, was it hard to get back into the groove of the Toronto scene after being in 
one of the largest cities in the world, the city of dreams, and then coming back to Toronto. Don't get me wrong, Toronto is a fantastic city, but to they break are, back, and that's great. Yeah, mm-hmm. we all know back that. into mm-hmm. the city. How was it for you to go? Okay, I was just in the center of dreams, and now I'm back in Canada auditioning for the same theater that I used to. I started out at. I haven't gone back. I haven't gone back. There's a lot of agents who are like, come back. I've literally been like poached, like like people have tried to poach me. I ha- I was with ETM. I was with Paul Smith because him and I just get along and Edna Kubiar and her and I, we just get along. And I even left them because I think I'm a little bit haunted, Chris. I think I am. I just don't have the faith. <laughs> I just don't have the faith that I would get cast, let alone an audition, like all of the memories are flooding me right now. I think the only way I would do it would be, well, before I left uh, Los Angeles, I did this one great reading and they're like, we'll bring the reading, we'll bring the theater to you. And I was like, guys, they're like, just let us know like where to put the venue. I was like, guys, I was a producer in Los Angeles. I don't know how things work here. Last time I left here, it wasn't on fabulous terms. (laughs) You know, so I wouldn't know who to hook you up with Theater Rise, but I would love to do his play. Um, I don't know how it's going to pan out here. I still managed to do a couple voice gigs just because of like Magic School was coming back. But I don't know if I want to put myself through the, all of this again. I think I've had my fill. And actually, which I'm I still- think is I think the segue that you're about to say is the segue that I want to say as well. OK. I'm not, I have stopped in Toronto, but I haven't stopped in theater. I'm actually on Notch Theater's board of advisory directors. So who would have thunk it? But also in part two with Lisa Jai on the Cross Border Interview podcast, you were just about to prepare for a yes. Zoom theater production yes. down in New York about the pandemic. Yes. So, Greatest thing. Okay. So see how everything works out 180. So Ashley Teague is my girl. Oh my God, Chris. Yes. I can't believe it. I even talked to you about this that I I like, I sent you this in the message and I totally forgot. So see how everything always works out. So I was here. I was so depressed and I would call people in Los Angeles and they were, Oh my God, my one friend, he's like, Lisa, you might not believe it, but somebody somewhere is going to remember seeing you in something and they're going to book you. And I was like, no, this is Canada. It's never going to happen. And then I get this call. No, I want to catch up with my friend, Ashley Teague, who was the assistant director for the first thing. Bill Pullman came out, um, Cornerstone Theaters, The Unrequited. And I just said, like, you know, she was always a solid person. So I reached out and I was like, I hope you and your significant other are great. And then she's like, I started a theater company. We're working on a project. I think you'd be great for da 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 And I was like, oh my God, miracles happen. So if you're listening to this, miracles do happen. Oh my God, Chris, thank you. I, and thank I, you I, to Ashley I remember. You should have her. If she yes, was- you do oh. remember things. She wants to come on the show. I'd be happy to have her. <laughs> really? Because she yeah. is a lot more eloquent and focused than I am. And she is doing really good things, not just for like me as a person with a disability. And she's like, this is why we need you on our board. But like for women, you know, and for like, oh, my God. So we did this amazing, amazing um, live theater performance on zoom and it was like she went across like america and internationally like through zoom and and even herself um her and her team interviewed over 200 voices and how they were affected by the pandemic and i played a medical student an asian american medical student um and also just like an activist civil uh civilian so i was in both parts and like it was amazing. Like there was testimonies there and like people who worked at ice were there. Prison oh, wow. guards were there. Oh my God. It was epic. You should check it out. Well, if it's available to be seen in Canada, I totally would. 
Notch.com, baby. And no. this is the thing. She's giving away her art. She's such a real artist. She's like, okay, it's notchtheater.org or something, but it's Notch Theater. You would think that me being an advisory committee member, I would have my shit together. But I'm just like so flabbergasted that you asked. I'm so impressed. But for so those who are listening, awesome. the correct link to notchtheater.org or <laughs> how Notch Theater will be in the show notes. So please hit on that button, go watch it because I'm assuming it will be a fantastic play. I will be doing it right after this episode. We after we record this episode. Oh, um, thank you, Chris. Thank you for that shout out. No, I'm going to link you guys up together because like she's just doing amazing thing for the community as well. And she's in New York City. Oh, that's awesome. And we came up together. Well, yeah. Well, in L.A., right? Yeah, we were babies. <laughs> we were babies. Oh, my God, you're awesome. I try to be. I always have the best time on, on your show. Hey. I love when people have good times. I have good times when they have good times. But <laughs> as we teased in part three of your amazing yeah. appearance on our show. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> okay, you yeah. forgot about it. <laughs> I, I forgot about everything. I want to talk about one of the most well-known Canadians in children's history. You had okay. the You had the chance of actually being on their show. Mr. Mr. Dress Up himself, you were part of the, I want to say, Tickle Trunk gang. I was what? I was part of the, I was like a regular on his you, show. You were a regular on his show. So first yeah. off, jealous much? Yes, Chris is. <laughs> <laughs> to even interact with Mr. Dress Up himself is a Which huge honor. True. Yeah. How did you get this part? I auditioned. So <laughs> I. <laughs> Everyone else auditions doesn't mean they get it. <laughs> oh, this is so sweet. Yeah, you know what? I don't know. I um, I remember prepping for the audition. And, oh, actually, here's where Mama Son comes back in the group. <laughs> Mama Son actually was very hands-on with this audition. So I think she was like fangirling a little bit. She's like, Lisa, <laughs> Lisa. I was like, yes, Mama San. No, and this is not how we talk at all. <laughs> I was like, yeah, what do you want? And she's like, she's like, CBC, just like practice your vocal cords, sing, do your, ah, because they have kids who sing on there, right? And I was yep. like, oh my God. And then she's like, just be very nice and be very professional. And she actually gave me a ride. She gave me a ride to this audition. I know I brought the family together and she was actually really, so I got it and I got a call back and I don't know what the issues were, but when you get callbacks, those are the most nerve wracking. Cause it's like, you know, you're so close, but like yet so far. And I think I had like one callback. So I went on an audition and I don't remember who auditioned me. Then I got the call back and Susan, um, one of the directors was there and I didn't know. But when I got the gig, she was like, I'm the director, Susan. And she was there and she was there with one of the original writers. I never met Ernie. Ernie Coombs is Mr. Jessup. Never met him um, until they're like, you got the role. So I was Lisa on Mr. Jessup. And let me tell you how like the first couple years Christopher like not even like times years I would just like walk around the set and like I was in so much awe like you got to see the tree you got to see Casey and Finnegan I went inside the tree I went behind the door you know his like little backyard door with the three glass panels for windows I saw the owl and you know how talented Ernie is? He did the voice of the owl. Really? Yes. So he would run backstage and he would do like, tweet, 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 tweet. And he was just magnificent. He was a magical man. Okay. He was. I know. So, no, that so, was epic. So this is my Mr. Dress Up story because okay. uh, uh, we, since we're talking about him, I... Yeah. A, wouldn't have been able to be on the set. Two, was scared shitless. Scared shitless of Pokeroo. 
I still, to this day, have, mm, have <laughs> nightmares about Pokeroo. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it came from, but Pokeroo haunts my memories. Every time I was watching Mr. Draft up, I would hope to God he wouldn't show up. And then there he would be. And then I'd <laughs> run out of the room screaming. Was Pokeroo from Mr. Draft Up? Yes. <laughs> What? Oh, you mean the back, back, back in the day, Pokeroo? Yes. Yeah, because the Pokeroo kids wasn't always like the guy who looks like from Toys R Us. He was like scary. Like he was like macabre. Oh, no. Both of them. Even the giraffe, <laughs> the gr- gr- green giraffe, scared shitless. <laughs> really? Don't know what it was. Don't know where it <gasps> came from. But Mr. It's- Dress Ups and Pokeroo, <laughs> I'm done. I'm out. I do it. I I like even even when TVO puts it on the like Pokeroo hour. I'm like, nope, nope. Really? Walk away. Walk away. <laughs> I can't breathe. <laughs> so there's my Mr. Dress Up story for you. I'm jealous you met Mr. Dress Up, but I'm not jealous oh. that you're on the show because he was there. <laughs> Oh my God, he was a sweet. I never, I, you know what? I never got to meet the Pokeroo. What? Oh, because it was transition, probably. Because you to were there when in the 90s? No, I remember, yeah. It, I remember watching the Pokeroo and being like, it's the Pokeroo. And I do remember that older version of the Pokeroo was like, he was like, it was kind of like, it's like one of those like medieval circuses, like, here, kids. And it's I'm like, sorry. no, that scares the shit out of me. <laughs> The Pokeroo, Marigold, Bear, Humpty Dumpty. No. 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 I was around with like the funner times, like truffles and like granny. So <laughs> no scary ass, six foot tall, long neck, Loch Ness brown monster. Like what the heck? It was dressed in like a clown suit. <laughs> he had poke it, and then he, then they had a spinoff. <laughs> And he had a polka dot <laughs> shorts. And you're like, how does this giraffe have shorts? What is this all about? I am so confused right now. So then they tried to make it more child friendly by making it green. <laughs> Putting him in a clown, a yellow. <laughs> I can't. I just, I just can't. Oh my God. I never <laughs> thought of it that way. So there my, but getting back to that. Interacting with Ernie, interacting with Mr. Dress Up. That's the kindest. You, you, you always see, you always hear the story. Never meet your idols because they're always going to let you down. Never meet people and they're no, because they're going to let you down. One. Was Mr. Dress Up like that? Did you get an impression? Oh, he's not like his persona, or was he like his persona on air and off air? On air and off air, and he loved his wife to death, and she. Okay, I've got a couple things. Let's just put it out there. Um, He never has ever been inappropriate. And I was a teenage girl. I was an adolescent. I was like 11, 12, all the way until his last episode. And we became family. And he was always such a sweetheart. And um, he taught me the kind of actor I want to be. And he never had airs about him. He was the kind, he was the star of this international show. And he went across every day for his muffin and came back and just ate his muffin, talked to me like I'm a normal person, never had any airs about him. Wow. Um, And so I was like, I want to be like that guy. What you see is what you get. And he has the most lovely family. Got to know his family over the years. And yes, we were there when his um, wife, sadly passed on and she was hit by a car outside of the studio and he was supposed to retire that year um because they were going to open a daycare for underprivileged children and after she passed it was more her dream so he this is where it breaks my heart he kept on doing the show because that's what kept him going And I was there for the very last taping and you could see the tears in his eyes. Everybody was crying. 
Um, but he was a magical man. He taught me one other thing. Sorry, Chris. He taught me one other thing. And he's like, you see a lot of um, shows these days are all about buying this gadget or this. And he was like, for me, it's about teaching kids that, ah, oh, I'm going to cry. You might not have that much. He's like, you might have a piece of paper, some scotch tape and a pair of scissors. And you can still make something really magical out of that. That's exactly how he talked, you know? I, if I, then, it was the golden I age of the golden age of television with the Mr. Dress Up, Fred Penner. Like these were yeah. the staples of Eric's Place. Eric's Place. Uh, today's special. Like there's. <gasps> yes, today's special. Oh, yet again, the mannequin cool. scared the hell out of like, me. Muffy yeah. and Sam. <laughs> Well, I loved that show. I always wanted that show to come back. Uh, the Sharon Lois and Bram show. Like, keep it simple. Yeah. Silly. Yeah. Oh, but now, he was, I can't he, say anything higher above him. He was truly the Canadian Fred Rogers. And I, yeah. I, I he, he, well, influenced, he came from Fred Rogers. He started out as Fred Rogers. And then, and then he started out as the Jolly Green Giant. Yeah, and he came do, over here. I don't know if he did that. I just maybe have made up another fact, but he was um, on he Fred was Rogers. Started. I knew that, but I don't know yeah. what, like the timeline, but he, he was such a major influence. And did you take anything from acting on that set to everything? I Europe? studied him like a hawk. I studied him like a hawk, but he taught me how to be around the set. And he taught me how to treat people on and off the set. Like I did study him and he would teach me things and this and that. I felt so sorry for him because there was one script where I just kept on screwing it up (laughs) and we all wanted to go on lunch and it's live. eh? So it's kind of like live theater. But if you really do mess up, you can cut it and then go back. Right. And I kept on doing it and he just never got bitchy. He never lost his patience with me. Even the stage managers. And I knew in my head, I was only like 16 at that time. And I knew in my head, I was like, you know, if he loses it on me, the whole staff and everybody is going to come down on me. And he didn't. You know what I mean? He treated me with dignity. And um, and there was a couple of times where I grew up on that. set, So it taught me how to interact with live theater. So if there's a glitch, they'll like shoot you like the five, 10 second rule, like on on your hands, they'll flash me in the hand. So I learned how to like ad lib on stage, like, you know, think in the moment, think in your feet. Yeah. He taught me a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, Lisa, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly. Oh, my God. Thank it. you. Uh, Thank you for being my been, therapist. You know it always. Part five and six is already planning for season four. So Good. whenever you want to come back. Um, I would love to come back. Really. Thank you for giving me this platform. Yeah, for sure. Lisa, thank you so much to my listeners. Um, Lisa's Twitter page, Twitter handle, uh, the link to Notch Theater, the correct one, will be <laughs> in the show notes. Lisa, Jay, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate oh, it. You've got something special here. God bless you. Thanks, man. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associate. 